Welcome everybody to Experience Week. We're thrilled to have you all here. It's, it's going to be an incredible week for all of us. We're excited to be joined today by General Stanley McChrystal, who is one of the great military leaders in the history of the United States and frankly, one of the great leaders that we have in our time. So General McChrystal, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thanks for letting me be a part of it. No, we're excited. So let me start. I'd love to just generally address the issue of leadership. I'm sure that as time has progressed, your views have grown and developed. Let me just start with that. What, what is leadership? Yeah, I mean, I mean, been exploring that. And sometimes we say it's the ability to influence others to do something they would not otherwise do. But as you explore that and you pull that apart, you can say, well, what if I coerce you to do something? What if I threaten you? Is that leadership? And I would argue, at least not in the way that I believe leadership. So I really think leadership is something that is empowering of people you create in people that work with you and in large organizations, you create an atmosphere in which they are better than they would otherwise be. When the organization accomplishes things that inertia would not otherwise let it accomplish. And it then means that leadership is not a set of traits or a gift that I was given at birth. Leadership is actually an interaction. It's a hard to define process where you and an organization, you and the existing conditions around you, you and specific people who work with you, uh, you create and it changes every day. So it's not leadership. You can't go get a box of leadership. You can't take a leadership course and get some. It is a journey of constant uh, interaction. So you brought up inertia as part of that. I think one thing we see in our culture today is often that people feel victim to circumstance or situation. And inertia obviously propels us to continue in the course that we're currently on. How do you help people break out of that and, and step back and say, wait a minute, I have a choice. I can change this. I don't just have to keep doing what's been done before. I think that's something leaders can help organizations and individuals decide. Because you're right, inertia is an object at rest, stays at rest, or an object in motion, remains in motion in the same direction at the same velocity that it was outside of the thing. So the danger there is if conditions have changed, if the pot is starting to heat up, the frogs should jump out, but many of us are frogs and don't, or organizations move in, an, in a direction that worked before, they sort of intuitively know it's not working anymore, and everybody will look at each other and say, well, we need to change, and that's where I think leaders come in. I think leaders do several things. The first thing they do is point out to people that the conditions have changed and maybe the things that they did to get there weren't going to be sufficient for the future. So it's, it's helping the organization see and understand that. I think it's also convincing people that they have the ability to make a difference. There's a danger that organizations wait until somebody comes and, and solves the problem. So you've got to convince individuals that they can be part of making the change. And in big organizations, you can feel, wow, I can do my small part, but it won't really affect the whole. So you've got to empower, you've got to give that sense. And you've also got to give it a associated level of responsibility. If we don't change, or if we change poorly, if you stayed silent, if you didn't help move it, you're as responsible as anybody else. And so it's this sense of shared responsibility that's important. And I think leaders can bring that to organizations. They can unlock the potential and that sense of ownership that's so key. So one other thing that you've addressed is this idea of a leadership gap. And, and we have this expectation and then we have the reality. You've mentioned that leadership is easy to talk about and very hard to do. What is your recommendation then to how we close that leadership gap that we're experiencing in so many organizations? There's a great sense that leadership is this special skill that a few people have. And I would argue that if most people got together and listed the traits or behaviors of good leaders, our lists would be very similar. I would argue that the biggest difference is in personal self-discipline. So for example, I get up in the morning and I have a pretty good idea of what I would have to do and not do to be a good leader. But that doesn't mean every day I do that. There are days when I'm not a good leader. Um, so I think part of it is just the self-discipline to do it. 
Now, we tend to get motivated when we're writing vision statements or mission statements or giving general guidance to the group and we say, we are gonna be the best organization possible and these are soaring ideas and we're gonna work hard. And that's what we, in terms of what we say, and it can be very powerful. Sure. But if it is contradicted by the behaviors of leaders, if you say, we're gonna show integrity, we're gonna show compassion, we're gonna show all the things that consistency we want good organizations and leaders to do, and then you don't display those, then in fact there's this say-do gap, the difference between what we say and what we do. And that's where cynicism, cynicism comes from. In my first battalion in the Army, I remember I had a battalion commander who was a difficult guy, and he would talk about standards and whatnot. And this was the 1970s Army, and there were lots of problems, and we had forbidden one very substandard soldier from re-enlisting. And that was the right thing to do. He wasn't good enough to stay in the Army, so he wasn't gonna be allowed to re-enlist. But at the same time, there was pressure on the battalion commander to enlist a certain percentage, a quota each quarter. And the last day of the quarter, before my company commander came to work, I was a company executive officer, the battalion commander had that soldier brought from our company without talking to our commander, first sergeant, brought to battalion headquarters, they removed the prohibition, and they re-enlisted him to make a quota. Now you could understand the battalion commander's desires to meet his numbers, but at the same time, all we talked about in terms of standards and protecting the organizations, he had undercut in a moment. And as a young second lieutenant, I remember watching that and just being shocked and I, as I got older, I had a certain sympathy for him, understanding the pressure he felt, but zero tolerance for the willingness to back off what he had said was right and what is right in terms of maintaining standards. And that brings up a really interesting point. Today, I think a lot of people look around and see a dearth of leadership. And what is your advice to people that, to yourself in that situation, uh, years ago where you're not in a position of power or authority, how do you exercise your leadership to encourage leadership above you, to guide a direction when you feel like maybe your organization or, or place doesn't have the type of leadership you're hoping for? Yeah. Well, we sometimes say we get the leaders we demand. Other people say we get the leaders we deserve. I'm not sure about that. but. If you are going to a, have a good leader, you gotta start by being a good follower. If you think about it, if you work for somebody and they come in in the morning and they are upbeat and optimistic and they take care of you and they look out for your welfare and they do all the things that you feel empower you and make you better and then you turn around and you match that with disloyalty or you just don't work very hard or you criticize what they do, or when they try to, to get people motivated, you're one of those people who's sort of passively aggressive, you sit back and say, motivate me, I dare you. Um, then you think about it, we've all been in the leadership position with people like that. So I think it starts with being a really good follower, understanding that person is up there doing their best to lead. They may not be perfect, but they're doing their best. So you gotta come halfway at a minimum, and hopefully further. If you then have a leader maybe who isn't doing all those things. I think the best thing you can do is try to model a leadership trait you would like to see them have. Be consistent, be absolutely honest, work hard, take care of people, all the things that we know we would like to see. I'm not sure, people ask me, can you go up to your bosses and say you're a lousy leader, let me tell you how to change. And the answer is, in some cases you can, in other cases. That's just not realistic. But you can model those behaviors, you can get with peers, you can start to create an environment that sometimes will shape your leader's behavior, and at a minimum it will have a shaming effect to try to improve it. Sure, it's, I mean, those are always such tricky yeah. situations, but important to navigate. Let me ask you then about, about being a mentor. Uh, you've seen loads of, of people come up under your tutelage, what do you see as the strongest characteristics of those who are going to develop into leaders? How do you spot that and nurture it? And what is your advice to people as they mentor people in the workplace or in, in life generally? Sure. When I see junior leaders, of course, the first thing you're looking for is somebody cares. 
because you really can't manufacture that. They, they care about the organization they work with. They have a natural empathy for people. They're willing to, to make the kind of effort and to show the self-discipline to be a good leader. And you don't expect them to be perfect. You expect them to be learning their way along and to make some big mistakes. And you help shape them that. And another indicator is in when you go, listen, you didn't do that very well. You could do this better. How do they respond to that? If they get very defensive and, and don't, show the willingness or desire to change, then that's an indicator. Now, some people will go through a period and then grow out of that. But those are things when I look. There are certain natural talents as well. There are some people who are just very, very blessed with high emotional quotient. They can just connect with people. They have that ability. It doesn't mean that someone who's introverted can't be just as effective. It's just gonna be a little bit harder for them because certain things are harder work. When you think about mentoring, there's a leadership role when you are someone's direct boss and you're telling them what to do, you are giving them feedback. Mentoring is a little different. It can be a Venn diagram. A, a, your boss can be your mentor or your mentor may not be. Your mentor may be somebody else who can give you the kind of guidance and wisdom that you might not otherwise get. Your mentor, uh, should be able to sort of put you in a headlock and say, hey, listen, Mike, you know, I love you like a brother, but that wasn't cool. Right. Fix it. Similarly, your mentor ought to be somebody that you can call and you can say, I just got this opportunity to do Y. And your mentor will say, you know, you just committed to do X. And you say, well, well Y is a better option for me. I will have better opportunity. And your mentor will say, you just committed to X, somebody is counting on you. The most important thing you have in life is your integrity and your credibility. If you give that up for short-term things, it'll be hard to return. And your mentor ought to be able to tell you those kinds of things, and they ought to be able to remind you of that. And your mentor ought to also be able to say, you know, I had a similar experience. So if you want to find a really good mentor, find somebody with some scar tissue. Find somebody who has been around, been beat up a little bit, learned from it, and is willing to impart that. I love that. I, some of the best advice I ever got was to develop scar tissue. And, and how important that is to, to not be so reactive, to not be defensive. Yeah. It allows you the scar tissue to say, okay, let's, let's move ahead. One other area I'd love to address while we're on this topic is that of, of managing up. And you once said one of the most important things you'll do for the people below you is to take care of the people above you. Yes. Now, some people have a, a hesitancy to wanting to manage up. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like I'm being political. Yeah. But walk me through what that, that looks like. Yeah, I, I really developed whatever skill I got in this much later in my career than I should have. Because for the reasons you say, I'm, I'm introverted naturally, but I'm also hierarchically experienced, so I'm hesitant to go up to my bosses and either develop close relationships or to be particularly uh, seeming like I'm sucking up. I don't want to be a, an apple polisher, and so I tend to hold back from that. And I had to learn a couple of things. The first thing is I, I'm punishing my organization because my organization needs to be communicated to my boss. I need to sell my subordinates to my boss. I need to tell my boss how good my team is and the entire organization. So I've got to do a certain amount of information operations on my boss so that they get a, a real clear view of that. The second is I've got to advocate for my organization, not just their how good they are, but for things we need, resources, opportunities, and whatnot, so I've got to do that. And so you learn to help my organization, I've got to, to work up. But as I got older and I had some really good subordinates who managed me up, I sort of went to school on that. And what I mean by that is, as I'm a, a leader at a certain level, I had some subordinates who could come into my office, remember I had one, he, he works with me to this day, he was a captain and I was a lieutenant colonel. And, and I was pretty driven guy. But he would walk into the office, he would sit down and put his feet up on the little coffee table in this office. Now most people couldn't get away with that. But he would lean back and he'd go, hey sir, the, the boys wanna know what's bugging you. 
And again, that wouldn't come from anybody else, but I had learned that what he was doing is reminding me that I'm acting like something's bugging me. He's communicating to me in his humorous way that I'm being a jerk. And he didn't come in and say, you're a jerk. What he did was he's saying, looks to us like you're acting incorrectly. So what's the problem? And we joke about it and he could get me laughing. And, and so what he's doing, he was managing my morale. He was managing my leadership style. He was teaching me, he was giving me insights. And I had several other uh, subordinates during my career who could come up and they could see when I was under a lot of pressure. They could see when I was drifting off course. And in a, in a sort of deft way, they'd say, you know, boss, I know you're thinking about this. This is what you're trying to do. Maybe we could go a little different. And in most cases, what they said I was trying to do wasn't what I was trying to do but it's what I should have been trying to do. And so they, they sort of deftly say, we know this is what you're trying to do, therefore. And it was a, you know, a, uh, a thoughtful, careful way to not get me defensive, but to pull me in the right direction. The more senior I got, the more I understood how important that I was, how important that is. And senior leaders are very lonely because you get senior and nobody, none of your peers are around you because of the nature of organizations. And they need people to come up, not to be their buddy, but to be their comrade. And I think that that's a skill that we sometimes don't learn, except maybe through long experience. So what you've talked about, obviously this soldier who'd come in and, and put his feet up on your coffee table, clearly you had a deep relationship yeah. uh, with that person. You've also mentioned that if you could redo everything, you'd say people should all go river rafting yes. before, before anything starts. And because they need these deep relationships, yes. they need to be able to communicate and, and quite frankly to care. Yes. Short of actually going on river trips, how, how do you develop that? What would be your feedback both? It's, it's easy as the leader to walk in and say, let's all go on a river rafting trip. It, it's harder as yeah. a subordinate to say, how do we develop these relationships? Yeah, if, if you think about it, you say, well, I've worked with Susan for 15 years, uh, or I've known so-and-so for a very long time, and then you actually dissect the relationship, and we found this on some trading floors in New York City where we've worked. People will be two desks away in an open room and work there for years and not really know each other. They'll know their name, they say hi, but there's nothing beyond that because they're, they're working their separate uh, parts of the operation. So you've got to create those experiences. In the military, what you tend to do is take an organization and put it under pressure, put them on a very difficult road march, put them in a very difficult swim at their seals, something that tests each person individually to see what they've got, but it bonds them through this shared experience. Think of the people that we feel close to if, you, if you're in your neighborhood, you can live there for years, but if a house burns down and everybody shows up at two in the morning with blankets and water and it helps and takes some people in, you're never the same afterward. Everybody has a different relationship. And so I'm a great believer that you need to manufacture experiences that remember when we went through that and it was middle of the night, we had to work all night, we had to get the presentation done, we bought pizza. And, it starts to break down, and that's the river rafting analogy. You've got to put people, uh, when they are unable to maintain the normal sort of barriers we have, when they've got to reach out and get help, and then suddenly in the middle of that experience, you go, Mike, you're from Texas, aren't you? A conversation you'd think you would have had a thousand times, but you don't. The military does it in training, and then, of course, combat is the absolute crucible because as you do that, you suddenly feel this common bond. But there are a thousand other things, sports teams, schools, all of these, anything that pulls us out of our comfort zone, pushes us and makes us contribute to something, bonds us as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I mean, those are such important things to figure out. There's Clayton Christensen is a professor at Harvard Business School, has come up with the theory of disruptive innovation. He's also talked a lot about the fact that people apply strategies that they didn't intend to. Uh, he's talked about how at his reunions, everyone seems to show up divorced, estranged from their kids, and, and nobody left school thinking, when I graduate from Harvard Business School in 20 years, I want to be divorced and estranged from my kids but they've implemented strategies that are different than the ones they wanted to or meant to. 
walk, th- walk through how people develop the discipline, the characteristics to keep mindful of where they're trying to go and, and make sure that that's where they're actually going. Yeah, it, it's a great thing, and we'll talk two aspects of it. The first is you come up with an objective, something you'd like to accomplish in life. I want to be a certain position in the world. I want to have a lot of money. I want whatever it is, your, your objective. And suddenly, we have, usually we have several. And you then develop a strategy to get there. I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to work here. I'm going to do that. You, you think you're going to navigate that particular route. And it takes a certain amount of discipline to prepare for certain things, to execute their certain things, and it takes prioritization. Because as you start to move along, this is where we get into the fact that you decide, I would like to be very, very successful in my job, but I would like to have perfect work-life balance. And then you find the two are at a level of tension that are impossible for you to, to do both. And so whether it's intentional or not, a lot of people will make priority decisions they will lean one way at great cost to the other, and then later they'll go, you know, I really got that wrong at a point in my life. And that's, that's where forcing yourself to think about it, mentors can help an awful lot at that particular point in your life. The other part is we sometimes, I knew a lot of guys and, get, and ladies in the Army who start a career and they think they're gonna go start at A and they think they're gonna end up at some point in the future and they, I want this assignment, and then I want to do this, and I want to do this. I don't think I saw more than a, a few who actually did that. And they were usually the least happy person, people that I knew. Because what had happened is they'd made a plan. I graduated from the military academy in 1976, and the Army was very difficult, different in 1986, 1996, 2006, and yet they had this model that they'd created that, that was going to make them happy, and they moved along it, and conditions changed dramatically, and they were completely out of step with where, in fact, they wanted to, what would have been best for them. The people that seem to be most effective, it's sort of the fox and the hedgehog idea. The hedgehog's got this single thing, and they're gonna get there, and then they get there, and they find out that's not where they really wanna be. The fox is constantly looking at things, constantly adapting to conditions, making new, decisions, maybe ending up somewhere completely unexpected, but ending up in a better place because they're constantly looking. That doesn't mean that the fox doesn't have discipline, the fox doesn't have goals in life. It means that we've all got to be very, very cognizant of the conditions around us and willing to adapt to those. I mean, Darwin was on something with adaptability is the key to survival. So. Uh, to that point, when we set goals, when we're focused on a certain area, often people also confuse the symptoms with the cause. And it's easy in, in warfare, I'm sure, it's easy in business, it's easy in our personal lives to address symptoms and never get to the cause. How do you find your ability to break through those and, and nail down driving at the cause? Yeah, I, I think there's a desire <clears throat> to deal with symptoms because often the cause is something we, we really don't want to deal with. You know, take society in America. We say, okay, we've got a problem with young people at a certain age with crime and drugs. And we go, wow, what do we do about that? Well, we'll increase our number of police and we will build more prisons. We will arrest the people who are doing wrong and we'll put them in prison. And someone says, well, are the people that bad? If you go back to the root cause, and the root cause usually begins very early in someone's life, and it's got to do with opportunity, it's got to do with education, it's got to do with all the things that shape people to success, also shape them to problems. But that problem sets really hard. That problem means we've got to change opportunity, which means we've got to give people who don't have as much opportunity now much better. We've got to fix education which is a long-term process that costs money, takes huge lift. We've got to do those things. And, and that caused big problems because you had people down in different parts of the organization with no real clue of how it fit into the whole. And so they're, with good intentions, they're taking actions that are contrary to the outcome for the whole. So I became very much a believer in transparency. And I, I actually went through a period when I thought that things like the wiki phenomenon 
with information will become self-correcting because you'll get the right answer, truth will come out, and then everybody will see the truth and they'll act more or less rationally to fix it. And I still, the idealistic part of me believes that. But what we found with transparency in its manifestation in modern life is a little different. One is transparency has started to throw so much information out, much of which is just absolutely irrelevant to everyone. I don't want to look at your Facebook page and see what you had for lunch. I don't care. I don't think anybody does. You didn't have lunch at all. No, so. I, that's right. I don't have a Facebook page either. But um, so there's a certain amount of information that just goes out there that, that confuses us because it's not important enough for, for communication. I go back to Ulysses S. Grant when he was leading uh, Northern armies during the Civil War. He would hand write many of his dispatches in a little book on pencil. So here is then a three-star general sitting down and handwriting it. And they were extraordinarily clear, extraordinarily concise. And I think partly because he's sitting there handwriting this thing out and then sending it out. Whereas if he could word process something, he, the limits are, are not there. So then you get transparency where people can just start to pile a whole bunch of information out and ask us to curate it and figure out what's important and what isn't. Well, now we're also finding the challenge of figuring out what's true and what isn't. Because we get information out there that just muddies the water to the degree where we really haven't achieved transparency. What we've achieved is this extraordinary amount of information of which some combination of it would, would achieve transparency, but we're not there yet. Maybe we will get there uh, to where people can all have a shared contextual understanding of the situation and, and then they can act appropriately. Organizations can work toward that. I'm a great advocate of that. But I am much more cautious about how people pass information now. And I, I don't believe that all is better now. And even more is not better if you don't do it in a careful way so that what, what transparency we share, and there should be a lot, is actually correct, timely, and relevant. Thank you. So we, we did talk about uh, a number of issues. One that is facing a lot of people in the workplace today uh, in the military is dealing with a generational difference. Yeah. And some people feel threatened by that, others take advantage of it. Um, what's your advice as, as people go through this? I know you've, you've shared that those in the military, for example, you've got your stereotypical muscled uh, man and then you had all of these analysts who came in yeah. with tattoos and earrings and piercings and you bridged that divide. Walk, walk us through how to do that and what that looks like. Yeah, th th there is a, uh, if we talk generational divide, there's sort of a natural divide between any organization. It's always been the case. It breaks down in strata because people who are of a certain age have a similar background, they have similar songs they listen to, similar movies they went to, books they read, and the young people never listen to the same stuff, never watch the same movie, so they don't get it. Um, and now that I'm older, I have a, a particular view on that. And so you have a, a shared experience of a generational time that differs with each generation, and so that creates a certain amount of uh, challenge communicating across it. I can tell a joke here that certain parts of my team will laugh at and the rest of my team will have no idea what I'm talking about. So, so that's one. There's another that, of course, it goes vertically now. It's different backgrounds, different upbringings, different opportunities, that sort of thing. And we tend to get in our communities now, whether whatever our community is, it might be a community of college jocks, it might be a community uh, of a certain religion, it might be a race, it might be anything. And we get in those silos and we tend to develop our own lexicon and our own jokes and our own everything. And it's not evil in intent, it just creates in that little ecosystem the world in which we operate. So you're trying to break through these and there are several things I think you have to do. First is force interaction. Force interaction in a way that that isn't as stilted or as wooden as it once was. I grew up in the military and everybody wore their rank and their experience, their resume on their uniform. You could tell where they'd served, you could tell what they'd done in general terms, and you certainly could tell their rank. And so, 
captains are more formal with majors and, and it goes on up and same with the greater the divide, the harder it was to communicate across that because it was just such a gulf and almost intimidating uh, potential power. So you gotta create things where people communicate effectively and not in a completely egalitarian way because that's just unrealistic. Not everybody in an organization is the same rank, experience, power, and whatnot. But you can create ways where you open up information, where you value everybody's inputs. In fact, you ask and demand everyone's inputs. But you have to create an environment to do that. Because if you don't create an environment where that is welcomed and expected, it won't come. Because nobody's gonna offer their opinion unless somebody tells you Yes, we want your opinion. And then when you do the trial balloon and offer your opinion, people don't immediately dismiss it and shun and, and send you away. So it's creating that kind of environment. And it's increasingly important in today's world because that environment is the only way an organization gets fast enough to be effective. In the old days, you could sort of make information work its way up to the top and work its way down. It really didn't work well, but we didn't have another alternative. Sure. Now we got alternatives, and so your competition's doing it. And if your competition's doing it and you're not, you lose. So on this topic of making it safe to, to communicate, to talk, I'd love to chat about failure. Sure. So failure comes, especially in, in your yeah. world, at, at a very high cost. Yeah. At the same time, if organizations are going to develop, to innovate, to, to become better and, and different, they've got to make it safe to fail yeah. or to try new things. How do you create that culture without licensing just a cavalier nature, but, but help yeah. people know you can fail, you can come up with ideas. It's okay if they were the wrong one, we just need to try new and different things. Yeah, uh, and we in the military have not done that very well. Uh, for lots of reasons. Part of it is the cost is high in combat, but we don't, really underwrite failure in peacetime very well either, so that excuse isn't really valuable. I think the first thing you have to do is separate failure in two piles. The first is a failure of what I'd say is negligence, and the second is a failure of some other reason. And what I mean by negligence, if you, if you didn't do your homework, if you didn't put enough effort, if you didn't do the things that were reasonably open to you, to give you a probability of success and you fail, shame on you. And leaders have got to act on that. You've either got to correct that person or you've got to get rid of them. Everything else can be a failure of judgment, it can be a failure of luck, it can be a failure of any number of factors. Those have got to be celebrated. And when I say celebrated, you've really got to communicate to the organization, hey, you took a shot at that, I'm glad you did, I want you to take more shots. Now the organization will hear you say that and they won't immediately believe it because they will look for subtle indicators of whether you mean it. The leader stands up on day one, brand new leader says, I really want people to try and fail and it's okay. The organization says, okay, and they watch. They watch who gets promoted. They watch what's happened to people who fail. They watch whether the organizations, let's say teams or parts of the organization that fail trying nobly whether they get resourced, whether they get other shots at that. They'll watch all those indicators and they will shape their own behavior accordingly. And the greatest danger is if they conclude that failure is a problem, even if they're not negligence, what they'll do is they'll start to mitigate that risk. And to mitigate that risk, they will start to seek perfect information. They'll try to seek unlimited number of resources in some cases, they'll, they'll try never to do anything that involves any risk. And so what you basically do is shape an organization that won't make any tough decisions. They will only do things that are absolutely slam dunks. And once you're there in an organization, you can't take any chances, you can't make any real progress. But it's insidious how quickly that grows and how you'll find people who are masters in an organization of avoiding risk for sometimes a career. And they're kind of Teflon leaders and you won't immediately know it, but you'll find it. And, and they've unconsciously developed this extraordinary ability to avoid either failure or responsibility for it. And that's gotta be 
really exorcised from every organization. Right, and, and too, too common today, yes. I think. Um, let's talk now about experience. Experience is a double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, the world is changing so quickly that if we do what's always been done, yeah. it's not going to work. At the same time, we need to be informed by it to leverage our experience into the future. Yeah. Walk through how you train people to understand the experience that they have and apply it to new concepts, new constructs that are going to be different in this fast-paced world. Yeah, you know, there was a study on decision-making years ago, and what they said was, most of us satisfice, not optimize. Optimize means you get all the data in the world that available to you, you look at potential courses of action, you see which one is best, you choose that, you optimize and, and execute. And for very de deliberate decision-making processes, that's what people do. But if, for example, you and I are here and we hear that the building's on fire, you would not say, okay, let me gather information on that, what are my three courses of action, or, you know, and then pick the best one. What you do is you have the equivalent of a Rolodex or a database, and it starts to, to go through your brain really quickly. And you hit the first one that satisfies or seems like it's got a reasonable probability of working, you go and you execute. And so we always said that experience gives people bigger Rolodexes. They've seen more stuff. They can go through there and they can say, yep, oh, this is kind of similar to what I saw before. Therefore, looks like that I can execute off of that. I think that's basically accurate. Our danger is what we're trying to do is create a series of templates for dealing with general situations, but not trying to make them specific not trying to take this Rolodex to produce a template for this and says, last time I did this, therefore that's the right answer and that's what I'm gonna do because it's never exactly right because the conditions are different. Instead, what we wanna create in people is this experience of dealing with problems, dealing with hairy problems that they didn't know how to, to deal with. And so you wanna put people in as many jobs, as many situations as you can where they didn't have the directions on a piece of paper. They couldn't pull it out and say, okay, step one, step 10. What you really want them to do is in a situation, but they've been in that, that kind of situation enough times, you go, you gotta do something, you don't have directions for it. How do I think about it? How do I gather information how to make a quick decision and execute? Those become the most effective uh, decision makers in my view. So that experience, the idea that if we want somebody to be a candle maker, that we want them to have made candles for 40 years, there's some value in that. But candles may be different next year than they are for the last 40, 40 years. So you've got to balance that experience with the idea that this person's done a bunch of other stuff, all of which will increase their flexibility, the open-minded way in which they approach candles in the 21st century or whatever. So on this topic of decision-making, there's a lot of research on decision fatigue, how later in the day we stop being able to process hard decisions, et cetera. Can you walk us through how you've structured your day in order to prioritize what you want to accomplish and, and don't fall victim to making poor decisions because of decision fatigue? Yeah, I, I think poorly would be my first answer. Um, but, but it's absolutely right. I am much better early in the morning than I am late in the afternoon or in the evening. And so I've learned that by experience. And, and so the way I structure my day basically is I get up very early, and I work out. I get that done first, so I don't have to think about when I'm gonna fit that in for the rest of the day. Then I come into work, I try to give myself between 30 minutes and an hour before I have anything scheduled, where I go through with my assistant, we look at my schedule, we talk about stuff, I look at email, it just sort of lets me line things up, and if there's something that came out that's really hot from the night before or whatever, I can deal with that so I'm not distracted as I go into uh, the day. I try to decide what decisions I'm gonna make that day. And I try to, to make it not very many. And so, for example, this afternoon, I've got a meeting with our senior team here. We're gonna talk about our growth strategy. That's a big deal. And so I've sort of saved my intellectual thinking on that. And then we're gonna have another meeting after that on the redesign for the office, because we're gonna redo that. Those are two pretty big ones. What I do with other decisions, though, is 
I think I've got X number of decisions in me for a day, and that sounds weak, but I try to push as many decisions off as I can. My, uh, my executive assistant makes huge, dis all the decisions on my schedule, where I go. I don't even try to make them, because I found even if I make, might make something a little bit better for myself, it's not worth the intellectual commitment for me to be involved in it. I just say, tell me when I'm going, where I'm going, hand me the ticket, we'll be good. Similarly, inside the organization, I try to make my decisions be big things. We want to go in this direction. Now, don't ask me to opine on the specifics of this, this, and this, because that'll cause me to get involved to a level that's going to eat up a lot of time for me to educate myself on that. And then if I'm going to make a decision, that's, a, that's an intellectual and emotional time sink that comes at an opportunity cost of other things. So it's not me trying to empower uh, people in the organization because I'm a nice guy or because I want them to feel self-actualized. It's because if, if I'm going to contribute effectively, those decisions I contribute on, I've got to be very thoughtful on. I've got to be, I've got to have the energy, I've got to have the emotional buy-in to do that. Everything else should go to people down the organization. Done correctly, we sort of do that at every level in the organization. And then we come to work and I'm going to make two big decisions today. I've got plenty of time to think about them and get them right. Thank you. Let me, if I could, get a little personal for just a moment. Yeah. Uh, Michael Phelps came and, and spoke with us a, a little while back and talked about how there was a point where he didn't want to live anymore. He identified only as a swimmer and while he was the greatest swimmer and is the greatest swimmer in the history of the world, that wasn't enough for him. Your career grew astronomically and then changed on a dime. Can you talk to us about what that means, how you define yourself and, and how we deal with unexpected changes that may come from seemingly nowhere? Yeah, it can come from failure. I mean, I, was, uh, I went four years to West Point and then I went 34, a little over 34 years in the Army. I was a four star. I was commanding in Afghanistan, and in the space of less than 24 hours, it didn't turn 90 degrees, it turned 180 degrees, or it, you could say it just stopped. In a moment, I came out of the Oval Office with the president, and I had submitted my resignation, he'd accepted it, and I'm on the road to being a civilian in a few weeks, but I would never put the uniform on again and work. In a moment. And you have an identity. I wasn't a great swimmer like Michael Phelps, but I had identified myself as a soldier, I identified myself in the, the missions that I had and the people I worked with, and suddenly that is literally gone. Okay, what now? Think of somebody who goes through a horrible wound in war or accident that stops them from their ability to do it, what, what their uh, vocation was, or has another experience that changes it. What I, uh, what I found was it was really important to sort of step back to first principles and say, okay, you were a soldier, is that who you were? Well, no, it was myself. And what did I like about that experience? I liked the relationships, the friendships, the bonds that I'd created. Those were the things that really mattered to me. And I liked the idea that I had a value set that had been, I'd been exposed to and I'd tried to adopt that I admired. Well, that you don't have to be a soldier to have that value set. You don't have to be a soldier to have relationships and friends and things like that and have a sense of purpose. So with the help of people, I mean, it didn't come out just out of me, with the help of some good friends and particularly my wife, what I was able to do is realize, okay, something died that day, but it wasn't me. What died that day was the route I was on, and now, actually, I had the opportunity to go on a new route. Uh, what died that day wasn't me as an individual and my honor or my, my sense of purpose or any of the, the skills that I'd done. I still had all those. It was like the United States during the Depression. We didn't have less, fewer factories or less farmland. It was all there. There was a crisis of confidence in the financial system. And so when you go through one of those, that's the crisis I think you go through. Uh, at least unless it's a physical injury or something, then you gotta still redirect, but still the core of you is likely to be there. And so I was able to, 
to have people point that out to me. I, I remember a guy wrote me a note uh, that says, first, you understand you are not damaged goods. And I'm just in that feel sorry for myself period of life where I'm feeling like I've been wronged and I'm damaged goods and et cetera. And he makes a point, that's not it, so stop it. And I was able to say, wow, a lot of opportunities if I take them. If I spend my life looking in the rear view mirror, I'm gonna run into something in front of me, it's gonna hurt me. If I don't worry about it, I take pride in what was behind me. I'm mindful about what I went through, not dismissive of it. Don't pretend it didn't happen, because it did. But I start there, I navigate from where I am, not from where I wish I was, and I start moving forward, then it works. It's not simple. I mean, it's easy for me to say now, uh, seven years in the future, and every day at, at the beginning, it's a little difficult to do that, but it gets easier and easier because you get reinforced. You start in a new direction. You reinforce old relationships. You build new relationships. You remind yourself in that priority list we talked about at the beginning, what's really important. The things that are most important to you, you revisit those priorities and you, you're able to look at them and, and focus your efforts and focus your emotional part. And then sort of the last part is, if something happens and you, you think for some reason you didn't get what you deserved or you got something you didn't deserve, there's this desire to demonize and hate somebody or some organization or some event for that. I would argue that hating takes a lot of emotional energy and it's emotional energy you can't put on something else. It can feel kind of good, you can marinate in your hate, but the reality is it's, it's taking energy you can't afford. And so you gotta be able to go, all right, I just don't have time. I may not feel good about that person or that organization, but I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend what energy I do have on something else. And that, I think, is the critical lesson I learned. I could have never predicted that that would be the outcome of, that, of the experience that I had, but it's probably the most important one in my life. Helped me the most get directed uh, in, a, in a way that, that I think made me a thousand times better than I would have been otherwise. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks to everyone for joining us for Experience Week. Please stay tuned for lots more to come.